Welcome to the Westminster Effects Doxology Podcast, where we exist for the glory of God and the tone of his people. I'm Cody Fields, president of Westminster Effects. Go buy stuff for your guitar, westminstereffects.com. Enjoying the discussion of the Westminster Effects Doxology Podcast Lounge on Facebook. And make sure you also subscribe, comment, and leave us a five-star review, even if we've been detrimental for your life. Just like Benny Hinn only cares about money, we only care about five-star reviews. I'm joined in person by... <laughs> You threw me off with Benny Hinn. Okay. Yeah. I forgot my name. Uh, Bradley Cox, Pastor of Resurrection <laughs> Church in Greer, South Carolina. And uh, and we've got a special guest with us in person. Uh, how about you introduce this guy? All right. So I, this guy and I go all the way back to elementary school. Yes. Um, yeah, buddy. Brooklyn Elementary in the year, it was in back in the 1900s. Yeah. <laughs> it was in the previous millennium. Yeah, it was in the previous millennium. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Travis Kearns, uh, who's a good friend of mine, uh, an avid cyclist, and is the, I, I always forget how your title is. So my title is Associational Mission Strategist. Associational Mission Strategist. Which is a fancy term for what? For nothing. For okay. he's yeah. in charge of the Three Rivers Baptist Association here locally. Yep. So, yep. And I am a cyclist, and contrary to popular opinion, I am not a robot. Oh, okay. And I do have all my body parts. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike Lance, right? But, hey, you said it, we're, not me. We're not going to prove that right now. No, we're not. This is going on YouTube, yeah. and we don't want to get caught by the censors. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we brought Travis on to talk about, I guess, do a post-mortem on the interview I did with Dallas Jenkins regarding Mormonism. Uh, you're kind of, you actually just gave us uh, this book for those of you who, uh, not watching it's the saints of zion an introduction an introduction to mormon theology so basically a protestant wrote a systematic theology yep. uh on mormonism uh so where do we even start I, I think a good place to start just a little bit of background on you yes you served as a missionary to mormons yep uh, in Utah for what seven eight years six years yeah. six years tell mm -hmm. us about that yeah yes. so that all uh, kind of has some precursor and the precursor of all that is all of my academic work in undergraduate master's and doctoral level work was all focused on Mormonism I started studying the church in January of 1996 when I say the church I mean the LDS church not right. the Christian church so started studying the LDS church in January of 1996 if I took a Baptist history class, I wrote my paper on one particular area of Baptist history as it related to Mormons in that same time of history or systematic theology, how do Mormons look at this? Uh, did that through all three levels, and my doctoral dissertation was focused on Mormon epistemology, so on the Mormon understanding of the notion of truth, mm -hmm. specifically in objective truth claims. So in 2013, we left. I'd been on faculty at uh, Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky for about eight and a half years. We left there and moved to Salt Lake City, uh, where I, for six years, oversaw all of our church planting efforts, missionary efforts, in the Salt Lake metro area uh, for the North American Mission Board, which is the North American Missions Agency of the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, and then worked alongside the Utah-Idaho State Southern Baptist Convention overseeing the rest of Utah and all of Idaho. Mm. So an 1,100-mile region uh, with very, very few evangelical churches, very small evangelical presence. Utah as a whole is about 2% Christian. Uh, but by God's grace and for his glory, uh, the spirit moved. We saw 56 churches started in areas where there's never been a Christian presence ever. Mm. Uh, all 56 of those are still in existence. There's more being added and just awesome. beating, beating some averages there. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the average stay for a pastor in Utah generally is eighteen months. Mm. Uh, we have one planter who was one of the first ones we uh, were able to start working with, who's been there since two thousand twelve. Uh, so he's twelve years in. So he's far surpassed. Yeah. Uh, the eighteen month average, and their church now has a network of churches that, if I remember right, at, at uh, today's count should be up to four churches, but their main church runs about four to five hundred. On mm. Sunday morning, which in Utah is a mega church. Wow. Yeah. Right. So one dumb question and then one actual follow-up. The dumb question is, is this how you got into riding a bike? No, I got into riding a bike in Louisville. Okay, uh, fair yeah, enough. Yeah, no, it doesn't have anything to do with my Mormon studies at all. <laughs> yeah. So uh, then the the follow the actual follow-up question is, what got you interested into Mormonism and that kind of counter-cult uh, ministry, I guess you could call it? Yeah, so two things. When I was in middle school, uh, every summer I would go to my grandmother's house and spend the day while my parents were working. 
And I remember a commercial coming on television. It's a guy riding a bike. This is kind of part of it, but it's a guy mm -hmm. riding a bike down the street and a Jeep drives past him and hits a puddle and just water just explodes all over the cyclist. And then you cut to the next frame and here's the Jeep on the side of the road with the hood up and smoke coming out, which is funny because I'm a Ford guy and here's the Jeep on the side of the road, which is very appropriate. <laughs> but the cyclist pulls over and stops to help him work on the engine. And it says, this message brought to you by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So I thought, well, that's interesting. The guy looks like he's pretty friendly. Um... And it said, call this number, and we'll send you a Book of Mormon. It's more information about Jesus. Well, man, I'm going to call that. So I called the number. I got a Book of Mormon. And my grandmother was independent fundamentalist Baptist. <laughs> so anything other than King James, she wouldn't let in her house. I can see right. where this is going. Yeah, much less a Book of Mormon. So I got it. I took it over after I got it to read it. And she made me sit on the front porch and read the Book of Mormon uh, while I was over there. So read through it that summer when I was, I don't know, 9 or 10, 11 years old, something like that. Then fast forward to my time at North Greenville at undergraduate level. Um, the first class I took in religion was uh, cults and world religions course uh, that was entitled, my, uh, let's see, New Religious Movements and Minority Religions in America. In other words, cults. The first group we said was Mormonism, and I just fell in love with it. Um, so when people ask me that question, it's the same answer. It's this commercial when I was in middle school <laughs> that made me first call for a Book of Mormon and read it. And then um, that course in college, and all I can tell you is God created me to do this. It's all yeah. I've done for almost 30 years, and I love it. So That's what, awesome. what was your impression of the Book of Mormon when you read it? it what, you said you were in middle school? Yeah. What was your impression then? Do you remember what? Yeah, my impression then was this is written in a really old English, and it's really boring. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> that Which is like pretty much everybody's response to yeah, it. Yeah, in fact, to quote Mark Twain, it kind of reminded me of chloroform in print. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's what Twain said about the Book of Mormon. I got to remember uh, that. Wow. He also said, if you remove the phrase "and it came to pass," you would have a small pamphlet rather than an entire book. Wow. Uh, <laughs> now that's Twain, me quoting Twain. That's not me saying that. Even though I often tell people, if you need to go to sleep quickly, just pick up the Book of Mormon because the old English style will put you to sleep pretty fast. Wow. I I didn't really have a religious response to it. Mm. It was more of an uh, just an inquisitive mind. Yeah. Um, it it didn't teach me anything about Jesus because it's not scriptural. Uh, mm. The parts of the Book of Mormon that are orthodox are direct copies of the King James. In fact, about 60 to 70% is just a direct quote from the King James Bible right. that Joseph Smith put in there. Mm. So there are orthodox sections of the Book of Mormon, but there's also some very ahistorical or ahistorical sections of it where Jesus comes back to the ancient Americas and visits them and uh, post-resurrection, those sorts of things. I had no religious response to it. I've I've read through it now 14 times, cover to cover, and I think the same thing every time. This is a book written by a 14-year-old. Yeah. Um, mm. It's poorly written. Um, the story doesn't follow very well. Um, the characters don't seem like they would have been real people. Um, and for it to be another testament of Christ, if it's really Scripture, it sure doesn't read like the Old and New Testaments, mm. that there's something qualitatively different about it. Wow. Yeah. Mm. So... I wanted to bring you on anyway and talk about counter cult ministry, mm -hmm. talk about Mormonism, stuff like that. And then it just so happens a few weeks ago, I make a Facebook post criticizing something Dallas Jenkins had said. And my old college roommate says, Hey, I bet he'd love to talk to you about that. Here's his number or whatever. And we have this conversation. And uh, so it was mainly addressing his statements of he has certain LDS friends who he is sure loves the same Jesus we do. We had a, what I thought was a fairly brotherly conversation. I didn't want to go in guns blazing. I'm fully capable of that. Uh, Bradley's seen that on Facebook plenty of times. <laughs> He's just nodding. He's just Sometimes nodding. I have to treat him like, you know, Barney Fife. And oh, yeah. Give Take me your, the bullet. Give me your yeah. gun. Yeah. Yeah. Give yeah. me your gun. <laughs> leave, leave one bullet in your pocket. Yeah, in your yeah. pocket. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and so we, we talked about it disagreed in public and such. And uh, so your response was basically this all comes down to, well, uh, for that statement, it's a Christological issue, mm -hmm. right? Walk us through uh, why that's such a big deal comparing the Mormon Christology to Orthodox Christian Christology. Yeah. So I think the first thing we have to do is back up even further. Sure. Because that's really a trees issue, if not a weeds issue. We need to look at the forest. Okay. So there are in Scripture doctrines that are taught, that mm -hmm. are plain, that are crystal clear. 
some of those doctrines are, if I can put it this way, more important than others. So a number of years ago, uh, Dr. Albert Moeller, president at Southern Seminary, wrote an article in which he coined a phrase, theological triage. Yep. Mm -hmm. So he says in that article, there are three types of doctrines or three levels of doctrine taught by Scripture. Level one is a heaven or hell issue. If you believe this, then you are counted as a Christian believer, you will go to heaven. If you do not believe one of these central core doctrines of orthodox historic Christianity— you cannot be a Christian. You are something else. Mm -hmm. This is not a statement to be rude. It's just a statement of fact. Mm -hmm. In other words, if I don't believe core doctrines of Islam, I'm not a Muslim. Right. I might believe four out of the five, but if I don't believe all five or however many you want to put in there, I'm not a Muslim. I'm something else or Hindu or Buddhist or Jehovah's Witness or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. The same thing holds true for Christianity. So that's first level is these are heaven or hell issues. These are issues of orthodoxy. Second level issues are not heaven or hell issues. They are issues that split denominations. Yep. So just because my Presbyterian friends baptize infants and believe certain issues about church polity, church organization, that I as a Baptist don't believe, I'm not going to say they're going to hell for it. Right. I might not go to church with them, but if I were to move into a place in Utah, for example, where there's nothing but a Presbyterian church and it's actually small Orthodox, I'm going to go to church there because right. they're proclaiming yep. the gospel. They're Christians. I might disagree with baptism and the way they organize the church, but they're brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and one thing that I do on business trips is I'll often go to a church that is not uh, basically Reformed Baptist uh, with <laughs> with. Uh, deep Pentecostal roots <laughs> yeah. down the road. Uh, like I'll go to a, a confessional Lutheran church or something like that just mm -hmm. so I can be exposed to something something else uh, mm -hmm. that I'm not used to right. and then also appreciate that tradition. Sure. Right? Yeah. So that those are second level doctrines. Third level doctrines don't split denominations. They split small group Bible studies. Right. Mm -hmm. So this might be an issue of a particular English Bible translation mm -hmm. or a particular view of eschatology of the end of time. So just because I'm not, or let me back up, I'm not going to, in my small group at church, at our church, which we attend, I know there are people in there who are premillennial. There are some who are postmillennial. There are some who are amillennial. There are some who are panmillennial. It'll just all pan out in the end, yep. and they don't care either way. Mm -hmm. You know what? That's fine. As long as they believe in the second coming that's bodily, it's our body, it's, it's a physical second coming, and we don't know when it's going to happen at some point in the future— that's what the Bible proclaims with specificity mm -hmm. about the second coming. The way you work that out is up to you. That's going to split a small group. The doctrine of Christ for the last 2,000 years of Christian history has been a level one issue. Right. There were Christological controversies in the 3rd century, 4th century, and 5th century in the earliest days of the church that brought together meetings of all the leaders of the Christian church at that time, and they debated these issues and when the biblical way prevailed, orthodox theology prevailed, those who were disagreeing with what the orthodox belief was, uh, what orthodox beliefs were pressed out, what biblical Christianity was teaching, they were thrown out of the church as heretics. Mm -hmm. They were said to be unbelievers. They were treated as unbelievers. They could not take communion in the church. They did not have membership rights in the church. They were treated like any other unbelieving person in the community. So when we say that the Jesus of any other faith tradition, and Mormonism is a different faith tradition, it is not Orthodox historic Christianity. It grew out of that. So historically speaking, it is a Christian faith tradition, historically speaking. Mm -hmm. Soteriologically, so from a standpoint of salvation and from a theological standpoint, generally it is something completely different. So when we say that the Jesus of any other faith tradition is the same Jesus as that of the New Testament, what we have to do is we look to the New Testament to determine that. And if that faith tradition disagrees with New Testament teaching where it's plain, then we have a major problem uh, when we say that that faith tradition or members of that faith tradition worship the same Jesus as we do as Christians. Now, some people may think this is kind of splitting hairs. This is not splitting hairs. I, I did get comments on Facebook and YouTube basically saying, well, how can you know if they're not saved or not? Because they believe in Jesus. 
Yeah. And, well, and my question is, which one? Satan believes in Jesus. He's not going to heaven. Right. Satan believes the historical record of what happened to Jesus of Nazareth. But just because he believes in the historical record does not mean that soteriologically he's saved, mm -hmm. that his sins have been forgiven, and he will in eternity inherit the kingdom of life. Satan will not inherit the kingdom of life. In fact, we know from the overwhelming preponderance of evidence in Scripture that Satan will be bound in hell. Mm -hmm. But he still believes in Jesus. Right, right. So there has to be a separation between historical belief, beliefs about things that happened in history, that even Muslims believe. But mm -hmm. just because Muslims believe Jesus walked on the earth in the early first century doesn't mean they'll end up in heaven. Mm -hmm. Satan believed Jesus walked on the earth in the first century. In fact, he was with him for some time yeah. in the wilderness. <laughs> Yeah. Trying yeah. to tempt him. So you can believe in the historical record and not be a Christian. And we have to be willing to say that and be okay saying that. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not being rude or being a jerk. It's just a statement of pure fact that if you don't believe in the Jesus as taught by Scripture and as interpreted by the church historically, you're just not a Christian. You are something else. Mm -hmm. And again, not trying to be a jerk or be rude. It's just a factual truth statement. Right. Yeah. Can you just like, I don't know how, um, how concise you can make this, but just bullet point for the audience, the, the Jesus of Mormons and the Jesus of the new Testament, like mm -hmm. what, what are the key differences in Christi Christ Christology yep. between the two? Yeah. So let's start with, with biblical Christianity. In biblical Christianity, Jesus is not a created being. Jesus has always existed. There's been no change in Christ from eternity past to the present into eternity future. Now, some might argue that the incarnation is a change in Christ, but Paul argues plainly in uh, Philippians that this is an addition to him, that he takes on the flesh. It's right. not something changing in him mm -hmm. right. in, in some sort of metaphysical or epistemological way. Right. Jesus is the second member of the Trinity. God did not create him. Uh, in fact, if we were to look at John 3.16 and try to take the word begotten as created, we've misunderstood completely, at least in an ignorant way, at the worst in a duplicitous way, that that word somehow means created and not unique. Yeah. Jesus is the unique son of God. He's not the created son of God. He's not at one point in the past, God existed, and then suddenly Jesus didn't, but now he does, or anything mm -hmm. like that. He's the second member of the Trinity. He is fully God, and at the point of the incarnation, he is also fully human and remains that way to this day and will forever into the future, uh, into eternity future. He came and lived on the earth uh, for about 33 years, had a public ministry of about three years. Um, we don't have exact dates for when that happened. It surely He surely was not born on December 25th. He surely did not die on Easter Sunday because, you know, Easter changes with the phases of the moon. Mm -hmm. So fairly certain Jesus didn't die based on the phase of the moon every year and it changes. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't born on December 25th, didn't die on Easter, but born, died, died on the cross, three days in the grave, uh, three days after that, rose from the grave, appeared for 40 days in physical form, ascended to heaven in the sight of all the believers who were around him 40 days after the resurrection. Ten days later, he and the Father sent the Spirit uh, in Acts 2 at the time of Pentecost. So the Jesus of Orthodox biblical Christianity is, is I think, plainly taught in the Bible. Second member of the Trinity uh, fully God at the time of the incarnation, not only fully God, but fully human, has uh, the same substance as God. So he's not similar substance. It's not homo usios. Mm -hmm. It's homo usios. That, it's that the, one little letter makes that a huge difference. That one letter makes difference. all the difference in the world. Same versus similar. Um, he is God in the flesh, John 1, 1 uh, through 4. And then John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Jesus of Mormonism is a completely different being, completely different. So in Mormonism, in order to understand who Jesus is, you have to back up one step to understand who God is. Mm -hmm. So God is a being named Elohim, which is the first Hebrew word for God in Genesis 1. Uh, so in the beginning, God is Berashit bara Elohim. So there's the first word used for God in Genesis 1 in Hebrew. But they give that uh, to God as his personal name. He grew up on another planet. He had parents. Uh, that planet had its own God that, that taught 
basically Mormonism. Elohim did everything he was supposed to do. He got married. He went to the temple. All those things in order to inherit what Brigham Young called his own sphere of perfection. Sometimes Brigham Young called it his sphere of existence. When God gained his own sphere of existence, now we can play with the words here, Mormons like sphere of existence, a sphere on which we exist, or a, a, another word for a sphere is a ball, a ball on which we exist is a planet, so God got his own planet. Uh, but if we want to use their phrasing, sphere of existence or sphere of perfection, God gets it. He's going to decide what to do with it. He takes his wives, wife or wives with him. By the way, he still lives in physical form. So in the, I've got here a copy of Gospel Principles, which is the Mormon mm -hmm. adult Sunday school manual. They go through it one time every four years. And it says, this is officially published by the church. This is official church doctrine. Because we are made in his image, referring to God, we know that our bodies are like his body. His eternal spirit is housed in a tangible body of flesh and bones. And that comes from Doctrine and Covenants 130, uh, chapter, or section 130, verse 22. God's body, however, is perfected and glorified with a glory beyond all description. So God is a physical being made of flesh and bones in a physical body. Brigham Young preaching in the tabernacle in Salt Lake City at a general conference once says God is about six foot two. He weighs about 235 pounds. Young held up his hand and said, God's hand is this big. If you want to take a wild guess, Brigham Young was about six foot two, weighed about 235 pounds, and his hand was <laughs> that big. He, he was, was not. He had a little bit of bias going on. He right? did. He was not calling himself God, to be fair, but he was simply saying, as an analogy, in the same way that I'm a man of flesh and bones, so God is a man of flesh and bones. Right. You could walk into the throne room in the celestial level of heaven and shake God's physical hand. So, Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother had eternal physical sex, and they created spirit children. This is where Jesus comes in. The first spirit child born to Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother's little boy, they name him Jehovah. Not yet Jesus the Christ, but Jehovah, a spirit boy. The second boy that's born is Lucifer. If you've ever heard in the audience that, that Mormons believe Jesus and the devil are brothers, that's how that works. Mm -hmm. To be fair to Mormons, every person is a spirit brother or sister of Jehovah and Lucifer. Mm -hmm. Jesus and the devil don't have a special relationship between brothers. Everybody is their spirit brother or sister. So Jehovah is born at that point. What that means is for the Mormon understanding of Christology is there's a time in the past when Jesus did not exist. Or to put it differently and quote somebody from the 4th century AD, there was a time when he was not. Mm -hmm. That's a direct quote from Arius. Mm -hmm who was declared a heretic by the Nicene Council in 325, or earlier in 321, they eventually produced the Nicene Creed in 325 that Athanasius helped to write. Uh, up until that point, Arius and Athanasius had so many fights that they exiled Athanasius a number of times, beat him almost to a pulp a number of times, but Athanasius stuck to Scripture and won the day at the Nicene Council. Arius was exiled as a heretic. All of his followers were exiled as heretics. They kept bringing this back up, though, because they thought they were right, but they were wrong. Again, John 1, 1 to 4 and 14 show plainly Jesus has always existed. Mm -hmm. In the beginning was the Word, the Word's with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, John 1, 1 and 2. So when you have a created Jesus, you automatically have something different, qualitatively different, and quantitatively different than the Jesus taught in the New Testament. And, and, and not only created Jesus, but created God the Father as well. Correct. So James Sire in his book, The Universe Next Door, it's a book about worldviews. He has in that book seven worldview questions uh, that you can ask of any person to, dis to determine what that person's worldview is. The first question he asks is, you need to, dis to discover from the person what is really real. And what he means by asking that question is, what is God? Or who is God to you? And he says, how you answer that question will drive every other answer to the additional six questions. Yep. Right. So when we say Mormons worship the same Jesus as Christians, there is a qualitative difference, Cody, as you just mentioned, because when God is different, Jesus is by definition going to be different. Yep. There is also mm -hmm. in Mormonism no understanding of the Trinity. In fact, they would argue that the Trinity is heresy, right? outright heresy. Um, they argue that when the last apostle died about three generations later, this is Mormon argument, something happened called the Great Apostasy. 
So basically the true teachings of Christianity, quote unquote, were lost about three generations after the last apostle died. So this would have been probably sometime around 160 to 170 AD, maybe 180, somewhere in there. But when the great apostasy happens, true Christianity is removed from the earth and not restored until 1820 when Joseph Smith has his first vision, Joseph Smith being the founder of the, the LDS church. When they say true Christianity is removed, what they mean is everything that's unique inside of Mormonism that's distinct from evangelical Orthodox Christianity, that was removed. Mm. That is true Christianity and not restored until 1820 when Joseph Smith has his first vision. And so they would say that they are the true church of Christ on the earth. They are restorationists, just like Alexander Campbell was with the Christian church, uh, like Charles Taz Russell taught for Jehovah's Witnesses, like mm. Mary Baker Glover Patterson Eddy for Christian Science, uh, like Ellen White for Seventh-day Adventists, uh, David Koresh for the Branch Davidians. All of these teachers believe that they were the true church on the earth. They were restoring New Testament Christianity. So again, a created Jesus who is not the second member of the Trinity, he is, Jesus is in no way, shape, or form equal to the Father. He is not of the same substance of the Father. In fact, both uh, now have two distinct and different physical bodies. They might work in, uh, in tandem with each other, doing certain things for the sake of humanity or the sake of whatever plan they're trying to enact, but they are absolutely homoi usios. They are similar substance, but not same substance. Um, so just to give you a quick little quote here, this is a great little book called We Believe, written by Rulon Burton. So it's the subtitle is Doctrines and Principles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So what Burton does is he takes teachings from the presidents of the church and from apostles of the church. And we can talk about how they distinguish those things later if y'all want to. But he takes those teachings that were given at General Conference, which makes these scriptural revelation, and he just pulls them out by topic. So President Joseph F. Smith, who's the sixth president of the church, Joseph Smith is the first president. F. Smith is the sixth. Joseph Fielding Smith is the tenth. So Joseph F. Smith says this, among the spirit children of Elohim, the firstborn was and is Jehovah or Jesus Christ, to whom all others are juniors. So Jesus is, according to the president of the LDS church, the sixth president, a created being. That makes Mormon Christology Arian, which historically, by every definition of the Christian church, heresy. Well, and, you know, I think, I think people, I, I think Mormon, the Mormon church is probably the most dangerous and deadly cult out there because of the, the way the trappings around it, it my, on the surface seem like Christianity. I mean, my wife and I did our honeymoon in Park City, Utah. We mm -hmm. flew in and out of Salt Lake and uh, on the way home, before we flew out of Salt Lake, we toured the we took the tour, like the dime tour, right, of the Mormon tabernacle. And it just, everything about it looks like the Jesus we know. Um, my wife follows some influencer on Instagram who was primarily focused on, like, home decor stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but she's a Mormon, and she's since shifted her Instagram content toward promoting the Mormon church. And a lot of her content of late sounds like, Orthodox Christian teaching. But what you're talking about is the, you know, the New Testament talks about the doctrines of, or, or the, the um, doctrines of Satan um, or the, what's the word? Doctrines of demons. Doctrines of demons. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. The doctrines of demons. And if you go to the church of Satan's website, they don't really laud the worship of this spiritual no, entity. No, it's all self It's human aggrandizing, yeah. It's mm -hmm. humanism. Yep, and yep. if you when you listen to him talk, what do you hear? Mm -hmm. You hear Christology dumbed down really to the level of human humanism, yep. humanistic thinking. It's it's the doctrine of demons. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that to me is what I think so many people need to hear and realize is that you know, Brian Onkin, uh, my pastor says all the time Satan doesn't print $6 counterfeit bills. Mhm. Mm you know, he's going to get as close to the truth as he possibly can without compromising his lie. Yep. And these things are not just a few clicks off. We're not just dealing in semantics here. We're talking about another Jesus that was more than likely, wouldn't you agree, created by Satan himself. Absolutely. Yeah. So mm -hmm. 
that will not win me friends or influence people, mm. uh, to quote Carnegie, <laughs> uh, inside the Mormon church, um, or people who are sympathetic to Mormonism. And you know what? I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. Um, the Bible is plain that either what you believe is from Christ, from the kingdom of heaven, or what you believe is from the devil. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Those are the two options. Right. Um, interestingly, about six or eight years ago, a man named Tad Callister, who now is a general authority in the LDS church, one of the general authority 70s, so he's in the some of the upper echelons of leadership, was speaking at a general conference, and he said, either the Book of Mormon is from God or it's from the devil. Yep. There are not any other options. Okay, I agree. Yep. Yeah. We're going to disagree on what we think the basis is, because Callister is going to say it's from heaven. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say it's from the devil. But I'll just quote Scripture and Elder Callister and say it is from the devil. So yep. it's either God or Satan. Now, here's the interesting thing. One of the things you mentioned is this is not a semantics game. It's not. At the same time, it is. Mm. Where we have to be incredibly cautious with Mormons, and this is with anybody who works with Mormons, if you've worked with them for more than a day or walked around Temple Square for more than 30 minutes, one of the things you realize is exactly what you said. This looks and sounds very Christian. That's because they use the same words that we do. Mm-hmm. Mormonism grew out of, as I mentioned earlier, Christianity. It is a, historically, it is a Christian group. Right. Historically. I yep. can't stress that enough. Right. Which is why they get counted as Christian in census data and That's stuff correct. like that. Right. Yep. Exactly. And because they have Jesus in the name of the church and things like that. Right. Um, the problem is, is that they use the same words, but they have a totally different dictionary yep. when they use those mm-hmm. words. When I say God... I mean a being that has always existed. I mean a being that is not in a body, in a physical body. I mean who reveals himself as Trinity. I mean the creator of all things. Uh, I mean, you know, all these things that historically Christians have have meant about God. When a Mormon says God, he means all the things I described earlier. He means Mm -hmm. Elohim who's in a physical body, who Brigham Young said six foot two, 235, hand is this big. Who still lives in uh, the celestial kingdom in exaltation with his spiritual, with his wives, and he has eternal heavenly sex all the time. Mm. Those are two completely different things. It's the same word, but completely different things. It would be like going to Saudi Arabia and saying, I believe in Allah. That's just mm-hmm. the Arabic word for God. Right, right. I mean something completely different than they do than a Muslim. So the difficulty is it's not semantic, but it is. And when we give into, I mentioned this earlier, I'll say it again. When we give into people who use the same terms and we allow our emotions to take over and say, well, they said the right words, therefore they must be Christian. That's ignorant at best, but duplicitous at worst. So I I don't want to take over here, Cody, but I do want to ask a question about that specifically. And this relates to your conversation with Dallas Jenkins, mm-hmm. who said he has friends that are part of the LDS church that he thinks those specific people might be or are on their way to or currently are worshiping the same Jesus that, mm-hmm. that we do. My wife asked me this question uh, just a week or two ago because of this Instagram influencer that she's following, whom... She listened to in post after post. Uh, I mean, this this lady has lost I, I forget how many thousands of followers since she switched her content. Um, but post after post, rehearsing using words that sound like Orthodox gospel, like you know, grace through faith. Believe, trusting in Jesus and in him alone for salvation. She's because p- she's allowing people to ask questions. People are submitting questions on her feed and she's addressing them like, you know, yes, we do believe this. We do believe that it's salvation by faith, that Jesus sacrifice was absolutely necessary. Um, interestingly enough, after Mary asked me this question, which I'm going to ask you, it, it took, we had a discussion about it. And then about a week later, this lady starts quoting the Book of Mormon on her feed, Mm -hmm. and Mary goes, oh. Uh, So here here was her question. Was, 
it, our, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you're a Mormon, if you're if you're a garden variety Mormon, you may not necessarily know. You you have to reach certain levels in order to be informed about. Well, no, not necessarily. So, the average Mormon knows as much about Mormonism as the average Christian knows about Christianity. Okay. It's not a if you pay more money here at Resurrection Church, you get more knowledge. It's okay. not Gnosticism. It's okay. it's not prosperity gospel and it's not Scientology. Right. That That's regard. right. And it's not okay. Benny Hinn, as quote as Cody quoted from earlier. <laughs> um the more you give, the more anointing you get. Yep. Um it, it's simply a matter of some people just aren't interested in studying their faith. And I use this example all the time. My grandmother in North Georgia before she died, she was a Christian her entire life. She's probably a Christian from the time she was conceived. Uh, was Baptist from nine months in the womb all the way until she died. Um, didn't care about how to work out the Trinity in her head, mm. but she believed it. Mm. Yeah, right. So it, uh, and I think this was mentioned uh, in the earlier podcast, Cody. There's a there has to be planting. Alvin Plantinga brings this up, philosopher at Notre Dame. He says there is a qualitative difference between cognitive assent, cognitive understanding, and cognitive denial. Mm-hmm. Right. You you can believe something without understanding it. True. If you deny mm-hmm. it, you're in a whole different ballgame. Right. And so so her question was, is it possible then for because, you know, LDS church members read the canon of scripture. They have the Book of Mormon too, but they like this lady on this feed was just talking about reading the Bible. Uh and and that's about all she talked about for a while until she started later started quoting the Book of Mormon, but reading the Scripture, reading the New Testament Scripture, is it possible, maybe in the case of Dallas Jenkins' friends, being somewhat ignorant, maybe, about core Mormon doctrines, but, you know, you mentioned the Book of Mormon quotes the King James Bible uh, in a lot of places. Um, he, reading and about the Jesus in the New Testament because they read their Bible, that they could come to know that Jesus. Now, I would say that if they're going, this is what I told Mary, if they were, if they, if somehow that happened by God's grace, they would leave the Mormon church. Mm -hmm. Like if if, if Christ was made known to them uh, by, by grace through faith, um, they would leave the Mormon church. But is that possible? That was her question. Is it possible that people could be ignorant in the Mormon church? And I'm, I'm thinking about Dallas. I'm not, I'm not defending Dallas. Let me state sure, that sure. categorically. I'm just asking the question, is it possible? Kind of, kind of a best case scenario. Yes. Yep. So let me open up a whole can of worms here uh, yep. that I don't intend to open and follow down this, this path, <laughs> but I'm going to open it anyway. In the same way that Roman Catholics I, I had the same thought. have the Bible yep. plus the Apocrypha, they have the Bible in their hands, yep. so Mormons have the Bible plus the Book of Mormon, Doctrine, Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, and Continuing Revelation in their hands, but in a vastly different way than Jehovah's Witnesses do because Jehovah's Witnesses have their own translation, the New mm-hmm. World Translation. Um, the Catholic canon, the Bible, the 66 books of the Bible, are not translated to make them theologically Roman Catholic. The King James in Mormonism is not translated differently to make it theologically Mormon. The only difference in a Mormon King James is the cross-referencing goes between Old and New Testament and Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price. And they they have that uh, addition in Genesis, correct, to to tack on Joseph Smith? So that's in the Pearl of Great Price. Okay. Yeah. So the Pearl of Great Price is made up of two books, the Book of Abraham and the Book of Moses, Mm -hmm. which are additions to the stories of those two uh, specific characters. Okay. Um, And then in Joseph Smith's history that's in the end of uh, the Pearl of Great Price, there's some addition uh, to the book of Genesis as well. Okay. okay. Um, but but they're not actually adding to Genesis they're itself. They're retranslating the it. James. Okay. That's correct. No. Yep. If you just if you pick up a copy of the King James published by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, it is a King James Bible, just like you'd get mm-hmm. from any place you buy your books. So in the in the way that Catholics and Mormons have the Bible in their hands, it is absolutely possible for a person to read the scriptures and be saved. Mm-hmm. Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. salvation. Yep. Mm-hmm. In the same way that a Mormon could pick it up, a guy in a hotel room in the middle of nowhere could pick it up because there's a Gideon Bible in the hotel uh, bedside table, mm-hmm. and he could get saved. I would say, however, that ignorance of Mormonism 
uh, ignorance of Mormon teaching, if you've become a believer, in the same way ignorance of Roman Catholic teaching, if you've become a Christian believer, would would come to your mind very quickly that there's something wrong here. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So Mormons rely on working through their scriptures, but they do so with the helps produced by the LDS Church. Yep. Roman Catholics read the scriptures, but they do so with the helps provided by the priest at the local parish, provided by the Vatican, on and on it goes. I think it is entirely possible for a person to be a Mormon and be a Christian, but it would be a very short, very short time where you are both. Well, I, I've said, I think Roman Catholics can be saved, <laughs> but they're going to be bad Roman Catholics. Cause I, I and, and that's me saying that I believe the Roman Catholic church has the right God and the right Jesus. The Mormon church does not. And so we're talking about like, if a person does come to Christ reading their published King James Bible, which is the same as our King James Bible, that it's it's going to have to quickly become apparent to them that this these this church is not talking about the Jesus I've come to know. Yeah. So if mm-hmm. if I've become a believer, I may not have yet been discipled, right? Mm-hmm. But I'm going to know enough based on the gospel I've read to know that when I read gospel principles, which every adult goes through every four years, where it says God's eternal spirit is housed in a tangible body of flesh and bones, and it's going to point me to doctrine and covenants, I'm going to go, the spirit inside of me is going to scream yeah, and go, wait, what are you? No, that's wrong. That's wrong. Um, So the problem becomes when we allow our emotions and look, having done this 28 years, I've got more friends than I can count in the LDS church. Lay people, uh, local bishops, stake presidents, um, members of the quorums of the 70, BYU professors. I've had lunch with four of their apostles. Mm. I know people from the bottom to the top. If I were to allow my emotions to drive what I think about their salvation, then I would think they're Christian because they're good people. Mm-hmm. They're good, quote unquote, Americans. It's and, and Mormons do have a history of turning out really top notch, like decent people too. Yeah, it's you know meeting the average Mormon family is like making a Norman Rockwell painting come to life. Yeah, yeah. they've all got a golden retriever. They're all drinking glass bottle cokes on the front porch in their rocking chairs with a ceiling fan, caffeine free. And, well, <laughs> caffeine is caffeine's never been a problem for the LDS. That's a common oh, misconception. Oh, it hot it's Was specifically it? coffee and tea. Yeah, yeah, specifically. Yep. So yep. they. Yeah, caffeine's never been an issue, but very common misconception. Um, so they're good people. They're very friendly. Mm-hmm. Um, another group that I've worked with a pretty good bit, Jehovah's Witnesses, are not friendly. Yeah. Mormon missionaries and Mormons in general are very friendly. Right. However, I can't let my emotions drive what I think about their eternal state. Mm. So if I'm looking at a person in Mormonism and the Mormon says to me, I believe in the Jesus of the new Testament. Okay. Let's talk about that. What do you, do you mean that you believe he walked on the earth? Okay. Satan believes that. Yeah. Right. Where are your beliefs different from what Satan believes? Satan believes historically what happened. Satan was a witness to the crucifixion. Yeah. He's also a witness to the resurrection, but he doesn't believe Mm. by placing faith and trust in Christ as savior. Right. There's a, Again, a qualitative difference between historically believing in who Jesus is and theologically believing who he is. Mm -hmm. So is it possible for a person to be in Mormonism and become a Christian? Yes, but they will run out as fast as they possibly can because the Spirit of God indwelling in them will scream at them, Jesus is not created. Mm -hmm. God is not in a physical body. God is not created. The, the spirit be saying, I am not created. Yeah. 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 Uh, it, those, that's just the most basic Orthodox theology I could give that the father, son, and spirit are not created, but Mormons believe all three of those. And when you say that, I think about, I think about Paul's words in Romans eight, where he said, it's by the spirit that we cry, Abba father. Mm-hmm. Like there, there is, you know, we, it, you know, God help us not to think that this th- this uh, faith that we have is merely an intellectual thing, but there is a mm-hmm. testimony of the person of the spirit mm-hmm. that permanently indwells every believer. I mean, even when I listen to him 
you know, re, you know, rehearse these these gospel New Testament truths about about God and about Christ. I feel I feel my spirit leap on the inside. Like, yes, amen. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, this isn't just like dusty orthodoxy. No, right. no. And I think I think that that's important for people to realize is that um, yes, the the New Testament. The word of God, we're saved by the living and abiding word. Like we're saved through the living and abiding word. If 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 someone picks up a New Testament in a hotel, a Gideon or a Mormon or a, or a Muslim, and they are by God's grace redeemed, I, I think you're right. I think there's going to be the testimony of this of the Holy Spirit in them that's going to cause them to run from something like the Mormon Church. Yeah, I, it, it's interesting to me that that really the two main groups we really have debate over about this is Roman Catholicism and Mormonism. Mm. We don't debate this when it becomes, when it comes to Jehovah's witnesses. Right. 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 We don't debate this when it comes to Islam. Mm -hmm. If a Muslim, which he's told in the Quran to read the Injil, that's the Arabic word for the gospels. Mm -hmm. If he reads the gospels as the Quran, so tells him to do, and he becomes a Christian. He's not going to the mosque on Fridays to pray. Right. right. He's not going to pray to Allah and say there's no God but Allah, Muhammad is his prophet. Mm. He's not. Yeah. Why don't we have that debate? It's interesting. It's, it's because Roman Catholicism and Mormonism are so prevalent in America and because we're just most times unwilling to say, I'm sorry, the Bible says what it says. It's yeah. plain right. and it's clear. You're not Christian. You're something else. Now, kind of back to, and I don't want to monopolize here, so y'all tell me if you want to go a different direction. Back to what you mentioned with uh, with this influencer mm-hmm. on whatever social media platform it is. Um, in the larger study of the sociology of religion, one of the things that new religious movements try to do is to become normalized in society. Mm-hmm. So, for example, Mormons mm-hmm. were not normalized in American society until after World War II. Wow. Why? Because Mormons signed up and fought alongside of Baptists and Presbyterians and Anglicans and whoever else in the trenches in Western Europe yep. for four years during World War II. So those guys come back, the the Christians come back or the whatever other religious groups come back and they say, hey, these Mormon guys are as American as apple pie. Mm-hmm. They're normal people just like we are. So our our issue is, is that there's never a debate about something else. It's a debate specifically about Mormons and Roman Catholics. But when they're, when these groups are trying to normalize in American society and in culture generally, what they try to do is to associate themselves with a group that's already accepted in society. Hmm. Well, what group is more accepted in, in American society than Christianity? Right. I'm not, I don't mean accepted as everybody's Christian, but I mean as seen as normal. normal. Right. They're not the weirdos next door. You don't meet a Christian as a secular American and think, oh, he's in the basement every night with a with, with some candles in the shape of a pentagram sacrificing goats. Right. Um, <laughs> right. When you hear about a cult member, though, you think, oh, they might be in the basement with some candles in the shape of a pentagram. They might be sacrificing <laughs> goats. So one of the things that these groups try to do is is show solidarity with, or at least try to become synonymous with groups that are already accepted. When Mormons came back from World War II and began to be more accepted, their language shifted. Mm. So with Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, uh, Lorenzo Snow, earlier presidents of the church, you would get quotes like you get from Lorenzo Snow as man is now, God once was, as God is now, man may be. What did he mean by that? It's called the Snow Couplet. He meant that God was once a man and men can become a God. If you think that he thought anything different, just a few days later, he's on campus at BYU walking around with the president of BYU, and he sees some children playing on the campus with marbles. And Lorenzo Snow looked at the president of BYU and he said, look, those little boys are preparing to become gods of their own planet by playing with those little small planets that are marbles. He meant a man can become a god because God was once a man. That's what he meant. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And and you think about now, like... you know, Jude talks about contending for the faith and mm-hmm. those that have Jude crept three. in. Yep. That was once once for all delivered right. to the saints. E- exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I'm thinking about this little God's doctrine that's infiltrating the evangelical church mm-hmm. right now mm-hmm. when I hear you talk about that. Yeah. Like it it 
I'm not saying it's apples to apples, but I'm saying it it does have it does have the aroma. But at the of, same of time, kind of, it is apples to apples because it's false doctrine. It is false right? doctrine. Being, being influenced by the devil or directly driven by the devil. So you get this significant shift. You would never hear the current president, Russell M. Nelson, of the LDS Church say, as man is now God once was, as God is now man may be. You're going to hear him talking about grace and forgiveness and happiness and joy. And that shift really happens post-World War II, but really pushes about 20 years ago. And it's specifically from a, a few BYU professors and uh, one guy who was a BYU professor named Brad Wilcox, who is now in uh, LDS Church leadership as a general authority. Um, one of the current apostles, who's the acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve named Jeffrey R. Holland, starts speaking about grace, the grace of Christ, well, again, when we think of Christ, we think one thing. When he thinks of Christ, he thinks of another thing. Mm -hmm. Wilcox gave a BYU or a general conference address on grace that was just, I mean, it hit, it, it went viral in, in the Mormon world. Uh, a man who taught at BYU named Robert Millett. Uh, these men are part of a group that's commonly referred to in Mormon studies as neo-Orthodox Mormonism. So it's kind of a new orthodoxy in Mormonism that's pushing it forward, but it's really an attempt to make Mormons look like they're as normal as Christians. It's this dictionary thing that you brought it up earlier absolutely again. absolutely is. Um, yep. I, what was it? About 2021, uh, I get a Facebook message. It says, hey, I see you like riding bikes. By the way, I'm a Mormon missionary. <laughs> and uh, and since and it was this girl and this other girl who were partnered up as as they do, and uh, but it being 2021 and the height of COVID, or rather the height of the COVID panic, I should say, um, they were only doing FaceTime calls. And so I was like, hey, wife, let's have fun with this. Let's see let's see what we can do with this, or rather what God can do with it, right? And, and let's get to know him and push gospel. And <laughs> Sorry, my stomach's growling. Your Brad, stomach did not like that apple. I know, I know. <laughs> it's been going like the whole time. I know, sorry. And I really hope the microphones have picked up every single one of them. <laughs> you could be the next Robert Tilton YouTube sensation. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you. If you've never watched those videos, go on YouTube yes. right now and watch it. So After you finish this. Yes, after this. Uh, but we, we, we were talking with these Mormon missionaries and they talk about grace. It's like, right, well, let's define this. And ultimately what they really meant was salvation by works. And even to the point of when they were talking about the, the different kingdoms, telestial, celestial, I don't remember all of the levels. So the order is telestial at the bottom, terrestrial in the middle, celestial at the top. Okay. So it, it came down to there were certain sins that someone could commit that would keep you out of the celestial, Right. And I was like, what about David, man, after God's own heart? What about Paul? Wrote like half the New Testament. They were like, yeah, they're not in the celestial kingdom because they were murderers. N nor is Jesus because he was never married. Hmm. He's mm. not in the celestial kingdom. He's not at the exalted level in the celestial kingdom. Yeah, we, did, we didn't get that far into it, but then it was like... It's amazing. It, like, how does that jive with the New Testament or the, or the Old Testament for that matter? Yeah, so right? what you have to remember is, is that they do read the Old and New Testaments, but they read it through the lens of Joseph Smith. Right. right. And they also have, again, the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, yeah. and Continuing it, Revelation. It's just more proof that hermeneutics matter. Yes. Yeah. We, maybe, like, we probably need to wrap this up pretty soon, but, <laughs> like, the... Your experience in trying to evangelize mm -hmm. uh, Mormons, you know, I've heard you talk about it some, um, but I can imagine what an incredible challenge that must feel like it is. I mean, we right. obviously believe in the power of God and uh, he alone changes human hearts no matter where they're coming from. But what was that experience like for you, sharing the gospel with Mormons? Yeah, you know, it, it, working with um, members of other faith traditions really does push you to believe wholeheartedly that Romans 1.16 is true. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. Mm. It's not my argument. It's not my clever words or phrasing. It's not me kick, dragging somebody into heaven, kicking and screaming because they don't want to go. It's the power of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit working through the gospel. So when, when sharing with Mormons, it is difficult. Working with other faith traditions is the most difficult thing you can do in sharing the gospel. Now, the good part is, again, if you share the gospel, if the Spirit so chooses, he'll, he'll work, he'll move, mm -hmm. and anybody can be converted. If Saul can be converted, anybody can. Yep. Yep. 
Um, so it, it can be incredibly frustrating. Uh, over the last 28 years, I can tell you I've had a number of times where I just want to bang my head on a concrete block. Uh, I'll often laugh, this is a joke, and say, I just want to take a Mormon missionary and grab him and shake him by the shoulders and shake the Joseph Smith and bring him young out of him. <laughs> that is not a positive missiological strategy, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Nor is that a New Testament prescription or description. Um, so what I love to do is follow New Testament example. The New Testament example we have for working with members of other faith traditions is Acts 17 when Paul's at the Areopagus. Mm -hmm. So Paul goes to Athens. He's waiting on Timothy and Silas. He's speaking to the Jews in the synagogue. He's speaking to the God-fearing Greeks in the synagogue. He goes to the grocery store, uh, the marketplace, as most translations say. He's speaking there. And then there are some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers who hear him speak, and they start laughing at him because he's talking about the resurrection. And they take him then up to the chairman of the philosophy department at the University of Athens office at the Areopagus. And when Paul presents the gospel to them, he presents the gospel in such a way that every phrase he utters directly addresses one, two, three, or four of the following groups. Greek mythology, Roman mythology, Epicureanism, Stoicism. One, two, three, or all four of those. Paul, though, never says Zeus. He never says Diana. He never says Mercury. He never says Epicurus. He never says Zeno, the founder of Stoicism but he addresses the gospel in such a way that it meets the particular needs and those people hear exactly what they need to hear. I think John does this in the gospel of John. We don't walk around saying Jesus is the word. Right. Mm -hmm. John chose that word though, because the pre-Socratic Greek philosophers were looking for one thing that unified the entire universe together. Their word for that was logos. Yep. So when John says, ain arche, ain halagos, in the beginning was the word, the philosophers go, yes. Yep. And the word was with God, yes. And the word was God, whoa, minds are blown. Yep. That's why he chooses that word, because he's addressing Christ to them in a way that they need to hear it. Paul does that at the Areopagus. So mm, wow. what I would do when speaking with a Mormon is very simple. Two of the main tenets in Mormonism are the priesthood and temples. We have to have a continuing priesthood both the Aaronic and the Melchizedek priesthood in order to, to gain and to receive blessings uh, on the earth. The other is temples. So we have to have human mediators. We have to have buildings that are mediators because in the temples, Mormons go through something called the endowment ceremonies. They also do baptism for the dead and mm -hmm. weddings called ceilings, both for the dead and the living. Um, so we have to have these human mediators and physical mediators in buildings. So what I love to do is just ask a Mormon, you know, hey, in the Old Testament, you know, all the things that were mediators between humans and God were physical. We had Abraham, we had Moses, we had Joshua, we had David, uh, we had these priests, we had the judges, we had the prophets, we had the kings, all these physical human beings were mediators between God and men. There were also physical laws that functioned as mediators between God and men. Food laws, Sabbath laws, sacrificial laws, all of these uh, festivals and, and rites that we had to keep and do all the time. Yom Kippur, where the priest goes into the, into the temple uh, or the tabernacle once a year to atone for the sins of the people. But interestingly, in the New Testament, all those things remain, but they go from physical to spiritual. So we have a spiritual Sabbath in our Sabbath rest in Christ. We have spiritual food laws where God tells Paul, eat whatever you want, take and eat. There's no more worry about crossing between milk and meat or not eating crustaceans or not eating bacon, right? Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord for that. I'm yes. thankful for the death <laughs> of Jesus so I can have pulled pork and bacon. <laughs> bacon. <laughs> um, the, the blessings of the new covenant are in fact superior. Yes, yes, yes. they are. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we, we also no longer have a physical human as a mediator. We have 1 Timothy 2, 5, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Hebrews 1, we don't need a, another prophet, priest, and king because Jesus is the final prophet, priest, mm -hmm. and king. We don't need physical temples anymore because we have a spiritual great high priest in the spiritual temple in heaven in the throne room. So if we don't need physical things because we have Christ... Why then do you think you need a physical prophet in the leader of the LDS church along with his two counselors and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles? Those men make up a group of 15 that are referred to as prophets, seers, and revelators. Why do you need a physical mediator in those prophets who make up the church? Why do you need a physical building? Jesus 
is the answer to everything you need. Not your Jesus that's created, but the Jesus of the New Testament. Let me tell you about him. Wow. Now, here's the thing. Mormonism is not primarily a theological system. Mormonism primarily is a sociological cultural structure. Mm. Wow. So when I say those things to a Mormon, the Mormon hears, you just told me my parents lied to me. Mm. You just told me my grandparents lied to me. Or you just told me my grandparents are in hell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they believed in the wrong Christ and they were doing things the wrong way. We have to be willing to say, you know what? The Bible doesn't say it'll be easy. The Bible just tells us what is true. Wow. What's true is you can worship Jesus and or you can worship something and call it Jesus, but I'm not going to go out to my truck and call it an apple and try to eat it. Just because I call mm-hmm. it something doesn't mean that's what it is. Yeah. Uh so yeah, it's very simple. We don't need these physical things anymore because we have the one mediator between God and man, or men, the man Christ Jesus, first Timothy two five. And then because I'm a believer in the power of Scripture, I walk through the Romans road. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 10.9 and 10. And let the power of the gospel do the work through the influence of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And that's that's fascinating. It's awesome. You got anything else? I, I'm, no. I had another question, but I think we should just leave it there. <laughs> we should do this again. Up to y'all? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah absolutely. Uh, where can people find you, your book, and all that good stuff? Yeah, so I'm. Uh, the book is available anywhere you buy books. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's the Saints of Zion, published in 2018. Uh, I will say that there. Uh, this is not a shameless plug for me to get a paycheck from the publishing company. Uh, every dime that we've ever received from uh, any royalties from that book have all gone on to missionaries in Salt Lake City. Uh, so if you buy the book and we get royalties from it, that will go on to help spread the gospel Love in that. Utah. Nice. Love that. Um, so anywhere you buy books, you can buy that. Um, because I'm the leader at the Three Rivers Baptist Association, people can go to our website, threeriversba.org. My email address is on there. You're welcome to email me. Um, if it's a nasty email, then it's going to be like Veggie Tales. I'm going to get nasty letters, and I'm just going to throw those out. Um, <laughs> if it's a sincere question, I'm happy to, to talk about that further. Yep. Awesome. Well, Travis, thanks for coming yep, on. You bet. Yeah, thank you, man. It's really good. Again, let's do it again. Definitely. Yep. Uh, well, Thanks for listening. Go love God. Love your neighbor. Make some music. We'll see you next time.